Uh, good morning. So um, I am an entomologist, so I do not study chickens. I study insects and related arthropods, and I happen to be interested in things that uh, like to feed on chickens, are associated with chickens. So I'm going to be talking about insects today. Uh, if you have questions, please hold them to the end. I've built in extra time so we can answer all those and that can help us stay on track with time. And hopefully maybe I'll answer some of those questions as I go through this talk. Um, so the way I've structured my talk today is I'm going to start by talking about how you can help prevent ectoparasites from getting onto your chickens. Um, and then we'll talk about the different parasites that you might encounter and how you can identify those uh, and what you're dealing with in your flock. And finally, at the end, we're going to talk about management. Notice I don't say eradication. Uh, these things can be very tricky once they get onto your flock. So really the best uh, strategy here is to try to manage the numbers as best you can um, and maybe not go straight for eradication of these insects. They're very good at what they do, so we need to respect that. Uh, I want to mention that a lot of the information I'm going to present today comes from backyard flocks here in California. So by working with Monica and the California Poultry Federation, I was actually able to uh, have a survey of backyard flocks and, and go out onto properties maybe just like yours and actually look for ectoparasites. So a lot of things I'm going to present, they come from California backyard flocks. And it was thanks to people like you that made this research uh, possible. So that's kind of part of this, uh, what we do in the university and trying to actually have research that uh, help, helps you know, people here in California. So where are ectoparasites coming from? First of all, it's, it's worth mentioning that anyone can get ectoparasites. It doesn't mean that you're a bad flock manager. It doesn't mean that you have a dirty flock. Uh, it can happen to anyone. Um, and it can come in from things like wild birds. Some of these ectoparasites uh, will, are nest parasites, so that's how they get introduced to your property. It can come in uh, from rodents or be moved around from rodents. So nothing we're going to talk about actually directly infests rats or mice. But what happens is they uh, can act as taxis and, and move things around on your property. And anyone who has animals on their property, they're probably dealing with rodent issues. So uh, this can be something that can help spread ectoparasites. New birds, so when you introduce new birds to your flock, they might be infested at low levels. You don't notice them, and then they introduce them to your entire flock. Supplies, so even just uh, cleaning supplies, they can get moved around. They can move around things, uh, things like egg flats, if you're sharing those, if uh, you have Ectoparasites get onto those and you move them around. Um, that can be a good way to introduce these things. And finally, people. Um, we none of, Nothing we're going to talk about today is a human health threat. However, we can, again, just like the rodents, move things around accidentally. So why do we want to know what ectoparasite we're dealing with? What would be the advantage to actually knowing what you're dealing with? The reason we want to know is because you're not going to necessarily treat everything the same way. And by having that knowledge of, of what is impacting your flock, it might give you a clue of where they're coming from or uh, how to manage them. Everything we're going to talk about today is an arthropod. So a uh, quick biology lesson. Arthropods are animals that do not have backbones, and so they have exoskeletons, uh, mostly we uh, deal with insects, so insects are six-legged. You, in, you interact with these on a daily basis, whether or not you know it. Um, and then the other group we're going to be talking about is the mites and ticks. So these are related to insects, but they're actually more closely related to spiders, so they're going to be eight-legged. Um, and I'll refer to these generally as arthropods today. All right, so uh, we talked about knowing your ectoparasite, because it's going to help you with your decision making, um, knowing a little bit about the life cycle. Uh, I'm going to make you all amateur uh, entomologists today. Knowing a little bit about them, again, will help you with your management. And then how are you going to figure out what we're dealing with? Um, so instead of sending you all home with microscopes, we're going to talk more generally about the description of these parasites, so things that you can do at home without any special equipment, and then also how these uh, insects or mites interact with, with your chickens. That's also going to give you some context clues for what you're dealing with. 
And there's three main groups I'm going to talk about today, the lice, fleas, and mites. And we're going to start today with lice. So uh, chickens do get lice. Uh, they are chicken specific for the most part. Uh, they might get on if you have other uh, galliforms, poultry, turkeys, there might be some host switching. But for the most part, these are going to be very host specific. And there are several different species that you might encounter. Uh, you can have one more than one species on your bird. Uh, and they are going to be feeding on the feather material. So this is how lice can cause damage. Um, and they're going to be on the skin and in the feathers. And they can be all over the body. Um, but where they are in the body might be more species specific than others. Uh, these are some of the species that are found on the body. Uh, it's going to be a little difficult to decide exactly which one you have. Um, they're all going to be kind of treated the same way. I actually have with me chicken body lice that uh, I will pass around as an example. And this is what they're going to look like on your chicken. So when you uh, pick up your chicken, handle it, and look at the feathers, we're going to see egg masses. So this is uh, where the lice will lay their eggs. They lay them in clumps, and you'll be able to see that when I pass around the Ziploc. There are clumps of feathers, and you might actually notice this before you notice the actual lice. Um, it will change kind of the appearance of their feathers. And then the actual lice will be running around the body. Uh, and they're typically pale beige colored, so I'm going to pass these around. Please don't open the Ziploc, and everyone will be fine. <laughs> Uh, and, and also, I'll just point out, the feathers will have a chewed appearance, so uh, they'll, they'll be lousy looking. Uh, that's where that comes from. It's they're all chewed up from these feathers. Chickens can also get head lice, so this can be another area where you'll want to look. Uh, these lice tend to be a little darker in color. I don't have any of those with me today, but that's another area to specifically look at. Yes, and everyone's itching. I should have warned you all. Uh, the first talk of the day, really setting you up for the rest of the day to be itchy. Um, and then the, the eggs will also be laid in this area. They don't tend to be as clumpy, as that's a scientific term, clumpy, um, as the chicken body lice, but that's because these feathers are shorter in this area, so they, when they lay them, they don't get into the quite as big of masses as uh, the, in the head region. And finally, the chicken wing louse. These are a little bit trickier to find. They don't seem to cause as much damage, so um, you're not going to necessarily notice these as easily. But they like to uh, live in these primary feathers of the wings. And we found the best way to look for them is to actually hold the wing up to light and backlight them. And if you have uh, coloration, if your chickens have coloration or specks in these feathers, it can be really difficult to see. Um, but they're going to be these lateral, um, they're going to, align themselves uh, perpendicular to that main vein and be in that feather. So the lice, uh, their life cycle happens completely on the bird. So they live in very close association with the animals. All of the life stages are going to be found on the chicken. So uh, from the egg, and then when they hatch into these immatures, which we call nymphs, all of them are going to be found on the chickens and the adults. Um, so they are on the host. And this whole process takes about 14 to 21 days. So this is a, a little bit longer um, compared to some of the other parasites. And uh, this is important because if you are trying to treat and then you see lice, you know, a couple weeks later, it doesn't mean you have a new infestation. What it might indicate is that eggs have hatched. And so this is still that same um, infestation, but now you just have the young lice again. So this might be something that you're going to have to purposely and directly try to treat multiple times for. All right, moving on to the fleas. So there's really only one species of flea that we see in association with, with chickens and poultry, and it's the stick tight flea. And I have bad news. They're not chicken specific. So if you have other animals, many people who have backyard chickens also have other animals uh, on their property, um, it can be a problem for them as well. And they get this name because of uh, their, their feeding preference. So these fleas have very long mouth parts. They're not like your cat or dog fleas um, where they feed periodically and they're hopping around a lot. They're actually going to embed in the skin, and they really love the face of the chicken. 
So uh, the comb, the wattles, uh, near the eyes, that's where you're going to see these fleas. And this is what this is going to look like. I'm going to point out these are where fleas are stuck. They uh, also really like ground squirrels. So if you're dealing with ground squirrel issues, that can be a wild animal that can be introducing them to your property, which can make it even more tricky to deal with because they're going to be constant introductions. If you have cats, they love the uh, exterior margin of the ears on cats, so they can be bringing them onto your property. And this is what you're going to want to look for. And this is just an image of a flea I pulled off of a uh, chicken. So you can see this is all skin material. So they really, really do stick onto those, uh, onto the animals they're feeding on. So their life cycle is going to be very different from the lice. So the adults I just showed you, they are on the chickens. They are blood feeding. So they're causing irritation to the birds through their blood feeding. They're going to mate on the chicken, and then the females are going to lay their eggs. She's not even going to detach. She's just going to stay stuck in, feeding on blood, dropping eggs into the environment. So the eggs and the immatures, they're all going to be off host. They're going to be developing um, in the litter or bedding around the birds, which uh, can make management tricky for another reason, so you don't know where all the life stages are. And they take quite a while to develop. So this process could take one to two months. So again, like the lice, if you're trying to treat and you see fleas uh, continuously, it could be indicative that um, you have immature life stages in the environment. And uh, just to point out, so this is some uh, sand under a microscope. Um, you're going to have to focus on the adults. You're not going to find the immatures. This is what the immature looks like. So you're not going to be able to see this in the environment. You're not going to know where they are. Uh, so you're really going to have to focus on the adults and kind of this macro approach to uh, flea management. All right, finally, we're going to talk about mites. Mites are my personal favorite. This is what I've done a lot of my uh, research on for my PhD. And we're going to start with scaly leg mites. Uh, these mites are uh, chicken specific. And they like to live in the skin under the scales. These mites are microscopic. This is a uh, image of it on the right-hand side. They're super cute, but you're never going to actually see them. You're only going to be able to see the signs of them. And I want to point out they have uh, these eight legs, these stumpy legs. They're not moving very easily in the environment. They're not crawling around on these legs. So uh, the good news is it's it's hard to transfer. They have to be transferred. Uh, by direct contact uh, between birds. And all of these life stages are going to be on the host. They don't survive very well uh, in the environment because they are so small, they can desiccate and die very easily if uh, they're off the host. And uh, so for this mite, we're going to be looking more for the signs of it. So the scales are going to um, have this white, crusty appearance to them. And uh, the next image I'm going to show you is a little bit graphic, just to warn you. What happens if this goes untreated is this can become secondarily infected with bacteria or other things in the environment, and it can cause a lot of issues. So this bird, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, this leg is almost completely necrotic material at this point. Uh, this bird was no longer able to walk. Um, the way the vet was able to confirm that this was scaly leg mite was he actually just cut a toe off and the bird didn't even react because it no longer had feeling. And so it takes a lot of special preparation to actually uh, do the mites, uh, see the mites, and he was able to do that and confirm that this was scaly leg mite. So this can be severe, but at the same time, uh, it can be fairly easy to isolate if you see it. You can put those birds in quarantine, and you can keep them away from spreading that through direct contact. The other two mites I'm going to talk about are uh, very similar, uh, so I'm going to talk about them together. So we have the chicken mite or the poultry red mite on the left-hand side, and then the northern fowl mite on the right-hand side. The northern fowl mite is probably the most common uh, poultry ectoparasite in the U.S. and including backyard poultry. Um, it is smaller, so this is about to scale, so uh, one mite is going to be bigger than the other. 
Um, and the way you're going to tell them apart is where you find them. So the northern fowl mite lives on the chickens. They love those fluffy vent feathers. So, you know, right by the chicken's butt, all those fluffy feathers, that's where the mites are going to primarily live. Uh, they live in the feathers and they travel to the skin surface to feed. Um, and if you have silkies, does anyone here have silkies? Okay, bad news. Uh, their whole body is like fluffy vent feathers. So in that, in that instance, the mites can be found all over the body. Um, and I have some northern fowl mites here to share with you. Please, again, do not open um, the bags. And uh, what I've done is I've just pulled a couple feathers so that you can see um, how many mites are on just even a few feathers. And you're going to see all sorts of life stages uh, crawling around. So the mite life cycle, uh, this whole life cycle, again, is going to be taking place on the host. So that is where you're going to find all of the mites. However, they can live off host for a few weeks. So if you have birds that are infested and you uh, remove those birds, and there could still be some mites in the environment. And they're going to try to survive as long as possible until they get a new host. This whole life cycle is very short. So with lice, it was 14 to 21 days. Fleas, 1 to 2 months. Mites is 5 to 12 days. What that means is that populations can grow very quickly. So very quickly, you can go from having undetectable mite levels to having an infestation like you're going to see in this uh, Ziploc bag here. Um, so that means you're going to have to monitor a little more closely for, for mites. This is a video of uh, me handling a bird that's been infested for about four weeks. And you can just see the number of mites coming off this bird and onto me. This is what happens when you decide to get a PhD in entomology. Um, the good news is that they do not like people. So they are avian. Uh, they will infest wild birds. This is one of those that really can be brought in from wild bird nests. Because if those uh, birds leave the nest when the younglings fledge, those mites don't have a, a meal anymore. They're looking for food. That's when they're going to um, start searching. And that's where you might have... Uh, mites get onto your property and onto your chickens. Um, I, in seven plus years of working in mites, have never been bitten. Some people claim that they can feel the bites, uh, but I assure you they don't start reproducing. I do not have an active mite infestation. So, All right, so the other mite we're going to talk about is the, the chicken mite. Um, this is an emerging pest. So this is something we're starting to see more and more. Uh, we used to never see this in commercial, and now we're starting to see this on even commercial farms. The biggest difference is that they do not live permanently on the birds. They're going to be living in the environment off the host. So you might see, this is a very heavy infestation. Uh, I hope you wouldn't see this level. Uh, but this is just to illustrate that they're going to be off the host. Sometimes you'll see them on the eggs as dark spots crawling around. Um, if you have hiding places, cracks and crevices in your nest boxes. Uh, I think based on uh, what I've seen so far, they like astroturf mats. So if you lift up those mats and you see things crawling around, that's going to be an indicator of these mites. So again, very similar life cycle as uh, northern fowl mites, except for they're not going to be on the birds. Uh, they are going to be mostly in the nest boxes or on the perches, and they're going to wait until nighttime to travel to the birds to feed. So in this way, they're very much like little vampires. They're going to wait till their victim is sleeping, come out, and take a blood meal. Uh, they can survive for a very long period without their host, so up to nine months without a blood meal. So once you get these uh, into your flock, it can be very difficult to completely get rid of them because they are just going to wait, lie and wait for that new chicken to come in so they can get a blood meal. And this life cycle is also very quick. So only 7 to 14 days before we they're able to uh, go from egg to adult. So again, this these populations can build fairly quickly. All right, so I'm just going to mention a couple of other ectoparasites. These uh, we did not find in our survey, but we are aware of them 
being issues in poultry and other places in the U.S. The first is bed bugs. How many of you knew, honestly, that chickens could get bed bugs? Okay, so these are the same, same exact species that uh, can affect humans. Um, they feed the, the same way on peop people as they do on chickens. So just like that last mite we talked about, they're going to be in the environment, in the nest boxes, waiting until the chickens go to sleep, and then they're going to come out and take their blood meal. And this uh, image on the right-hand side gives you a, a little bit of an idea of their size. So they're going to be significantly larger than the mites. So you're not going to confuse these with the mites. And these you'll actually be able to see. You can count their six legs. The other uh, pairs I'm going to just briefly mention are soft ticks. Uh, I think many of us are aware of, of ticks in the news, things like Lyme disease. They're a human health issue. Uh, soft ticks look very different than hard ticks. I always describe them as uh, crinkled up raisins. That's pretty much what you're going to see, except for it's going to have legs. Um, and these are things that can transmit diseases to your chickens. Uh, again, we haven't seen them uh, recently in California. I don't know if it's because of hot, dry weather. Uh, they don't seem to do as well in there. Um, but this is just something to be aware of if you do see these in your flock. All right, so now the part you all want to know is how do we control these things? First of all, I'll just say uh, don't panic. You can do this. Uh, they're not invincible. Um, but we need to approach this in a very logical manner if we're going to have any luck at controlling or managing these ectoparasites. Um, so entomologists, we love integrated pest management. Uh, I think because we work with insects all the time, we have a lot of respect for how good insects and arthropods are at their job. Um, so if you think for a second, these chickens that you have, they are the entire world to these ectoparasites. It's their food source, it's their habitat, so they're going to be really good at hanging on. Um, so when we approach this, again, I mentioned at the beginning, eradication is not our first step. First, what we want to do is we want to manage, we want to knock back these levels, and then hopefully at some point get to an ectoparasite-free flock. But this can take some time. The first and most important step when we're uh, looking at pest management is going to be prevention. So what can we do to help uh, limit exposure of our birds to these ectoparasites? And then we're going to want to monitor. I mentioned some of these ectoparasites, they reproduce very quickly, so they can become a problem fast. And it's a lot easier to deal with small numbers of ectoparasites than it is to deal with large numbers. So having a, a monitoring strategy and uh, keeping a lookout for these things can be really helpful. And finally, when we do get to the management, we're going to use different techniques. There is no one silver bullet that's going to work for everyone. You can't just go out and spray one magical thing and everything goes away. So we're going to look at uh, cultural tactics, so things about how we raise the animals uh, that might help. Uh, there are some chemical options, and then there's also non-chemical options that we can use as well. So prevention, this is going to go hand in hand with basic sanitation and biosecurity. So things that are going to help keep your chickens healthy overall are also going to help keep your uh, chickens ectoparasite free. So first thing, excluding wild birds in their nests. Um, so again, these birds can uh, bring ectoparasites onto your property. If they're nesting near your birds, when they leave the nest, they might be leaving mites with them. Um, so that's something that if you can exclude that, that, that can really be helpful. Excluding rodents. This is easier said than done. I am always dealing with rodents with my chickens. Um, but doing things like preventing feed spillage or keeping your feed, um, you know, in, in rodent-proof containers, uh, trapping for rodents, anything you can do that can help mitigate the rodent problem, that is going to help uh, prevent the spread of ectoparasites. Quarantining and examining new birds. I have an asterisk here because based on my survey, I suspect that this is how most ectoparasites get onto backyard flocks. In my experience, once people have one chicken, they were, they're going to want more chickens. It's almost like Pokemon. They're going to want to collect all the different breeds or all the different types. And that's okay, but you need to take precautions. And again, this is not just for ectoparasites, but this is also going to 
go hand in hand with disease control. So if you can quarantine these birds at least two weeks for ectoparasites for disease, I know it's recommended even longer. So if you can keep those birds separate and monitor them. So some of these uh, ectoparasites, the lice and the mites, at low levels, they're going to be very hard to detect. But if you keep that bird quarantined for a few weeks, if though there are parasites and those numbers build up, it's going to be easier for you to detect. And then you can treat that one bird or couple birds instead of having to treat your entire flock. So that can really, again, help from uh, having a small problem than ha dealing with a much larger problem. Cleaning equipment, even just hosing down shovels once you're done removing manure, stuff like that, um, that can really help with ectoparasites. Limit visitors to your flock. Again, this goes hands in hand with biosecurity. Uh, you might not know that you picked up a couple of mites when you're collecting eggs this morning and then, you know, drop them off when you go visit your friend. Um, but that's definitely uh, possible. And that goes with limiting same-day same visits to other flocks. So you don't want to accidentally move things and you don't want people bringing them onto your property. Monitoring. So I hope one of the things that you've taken away is that uh, all these ectoparasites have a little different life lifestyles where they're dealing with, uh, where they live on the bird. So because of that, the way you monitor is going to vary. Um, so for some of these, so everyone's going to have their own property. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. You're going to have to tailor this to, to what you have. Um, and all these ectoparasites are going to be a little bit different. So for some of these, you're going to have to just get in there and handle the birds and look directly for uh, ectoparasites. So this is my technique, uh, especially for mites. I found that um, chickens poop more often than not, so always make sure you got the cloaca pointing away from you um, and kind of just go through those feathers and, and start looking for things. With the lice, it might be easier just to look for those big egg masses, um, but you are going to have to handle some birds. If you have a large flock or your birds don't really like to be handled, uh, one way to kind of target your approach is to look for birds that have compromised beaks. So uh, birds that have uh, either commercially beak trimmed beaks or uh, broken or um, otherwise warped beaks, they tend to harbor more ectoparasites because they're not as able to groom as efficiently. So that can be uh, a good strategy if you're trying to limit the number of birds you're handling. The other thing is males. So if you have roosters, they are more likely to harbor ectoparasites. Um, it has to do with testosterone. Uh, but if you um, have males in your flock, that can be a good place to start. And that's also probably how they're going to start spreading among, among the flock. Another way uh, for the ectoparasites that live off the host, you're going to have to get a little more creative, a little more active. Um, I suggest you all invest in a headlamp. Go full entomologist. You should all get one of these. It makes it a lot easier to go through and look if you've got uh, nest boxes and dark places. Um, all those houses I showed up before, when I was doing my survey, I was crawling in all of those with my headlamp looking for parasites. Um, get the kids to do this. If, if you want, this could be a really good activity for them. Get them a headlamp um, and have them go and look in, under those perches um, and, and looking for things. And, and who knows, you might find some, some good stuff instead of uh, just ectoparasites. Another way uh, that's a little more passive is by uh, offering a trap. So for the chicken mites that live off the host, uh, if you offer them a place to, to hide during the day, um, and if you have mites, they'll, they'll go there. So this is just corrugated cardboard. They need these little hiding places. They're going to be looking for somewhere dark and safe during the day to hide. So you can put these out, leave them out for a couple weeks, uh, make sure the chickens don't destroy them or eat them. And then what you can do is you can remove this cardboard and tap it onto a light background, a piece of white paper or something. And if any of that dust stands up and walks away, that's going to be your sign that you might be have, dealing with some mite issues. Uh, cultural control, so things that you can uh, do based on your, your management. Uh, one thing is removing litter regularly if this is an option for you, especially after treatment. Now, I want to point out specifically, we talked about these stick-tight fleas. 
The adults are on the birds, but all the immature stages are in the environment. So if you do something that treats those adults, but you don't do anything to your litter, it's only going to be a, a matter of a few days or a few weeks before you start seeing fleas again because they're still in the environment and they're just hatching um, and, and becoming adults again. So especially after a treatment, if you can clean up that environment, you have a better chance of uh, solving a, a larger problem. Filling cracks and crevices, so I just talked about trapping and, and introducing habitats, but if you also remove habitats from your environment, having um, sealed nest boxes so it limits the ability of uh, mites to hide out in the environment, that can be helpful. One thing that uh, does work uh, is bathing chickens. I've done this. The birds are never happy. You're never happy. But if you have only a few birds and you really just want to knock back this, especially if you're showing birds and you don't necessarily um, want to use other techniques, this will work. Just a tiny bit of soap. Uh, you don't want to do this too frequently because you don't want to mess with the natural oils on the birds. Um, but it can work. Uh, Make sure it's nice and warm out so those birds can dry very quickly. Again, they're not going to be happy with you, so make sure you, you're doing this outdoors. And just also be aware that this is probably not going to get rid of all the egg stages, but again, if you're just trying to look for multiple ways to knock down parasites, this is one way you can do it. All right, chemical control treatments. Uh, there are lots of options. Well, there are some options, I'll say that, at your local feed store. Um, I'm not going to go into specifics. It's going to vary based on where you are, what's going to be available. Um, but as a safety, I'll talk about how you use these things. Always read the labels. Um, insecticides are not inherently uh, bad. It's they're used improperly. So if you use them properly, it can be a good option. Uh, and make it sure you're protecting yourself and your animals. So don't just go and pick out anything. Make sure it's actually something that is approved and is usable on chickens. And make sure you follow those instructions so you don't hurt yourself either. Um, so this is just an example of a label. So these labels are going to tell you what insects they work on, or arthropods. So what is your target um, that you're going to use? It's going to tell you where you can use it. So this one is not for on-bird use. It's for the environment. So it's going to tell you that. It's going to tell you what the active ingredient is. So this is the actual chemical that is going to be killing uh, your target insect. And then on the back here, it tells you exactly how to use it. So if you follow these instructions, you can use chemicals uh, as safely as possible, and it can be a good option for helping you uh, knock back uh, insects and arthropod pests. Now I'm going to talk about things not to use. Um, so off-label use can be really dangerous, not only for the birds, but also for you. And one thing that I'm finding and lots of people tell me about is they're using Frontline on their chickens. Good, that was a good reaction. If you could, everyone just went ew. Yes, that is, that is the knee-jerk reaction. Um, so Frontline has the active ingredient fipronil in it. Um, it is, it works for a very long time. So if you have cats or dogs, you might use this. I know I use this on my dog. It works really well. You put it on once a month or sometimes once every three months, and it works really well for your cat or dog. Um, these formulations are species specific. So you would not buy dog front line and put it on your cat. Uh, it could kill your cat. So why would you buy dog front line and put it on your chicken? Um, one of the reasons why it's dangerous is it's very lipophilic, which means uh, oil loving. So if you put this on your chickens, chickens have lots of natural oils, it gets incorporated in them. It's a systemic material, which means it gets into the tissues and it can get into the egg material. So uh, very recently in uh, Europe, they found fipronil, this active ingredient in the eggs. People are going to jail for it. Uh, this is very serious. It can cause human health issues. Um, yes, it will kill all the ectoparasites, but at, at what cost are you, uh, you know, doing that at? So if you've done this, you know someone, someone tells you they've used fipronil, just don't ever eat those eggs again because they don't know how long it lasts. 
So this is just one example, but this is a very serious one that, um, especially if you go online, again, we were talking about Dr. Google earlier, uh, people will tell you it works miracles. Yes, it kills ectoparasites, um, but it's not necessarily safe for your birds, and it's definitely not safe for you. So this is definitely something to bear in mind. Okay, let's move on to some uh, non-chemical control options or um, botanical control. So this, these are still chemicals, but they um, they sound safe because they're plant derived. Uh, so we have things like py py excuse me, pyrethrum, which is a uh, chemical derived from chrysanthemums. Um, there's lots of other options out there. People get neem, garlic based, um, and other essential oils. Um, I said they sound safe. Just because it comes from a plant doesn't mean it's actually safe. So again, be careful when you're using these options. Uh, because they are not uh, synthetic chemicals, they don't necessarily have the same rigorous testing as other chemicals. Um, they're not necessarily FDA or EPA approved. So uh, when you're using these things, just be careful. Um, that they can be used on the chickens, they're not gonna hurt your birds. Uh, there is gonna be more variation with these. This again goes with uh, botanicals. They're not synthetically made, so um, there can be more variation in the plants. They typically don't last as long either, so just be aware if you do start looking at uh, botanical or essential oil options that they don't have very long residuals, so you might need to use them more frequently or rotate it with other options. Yes, and what about the chicken? So again, just because it comes from a plant, it sounds safe, doesn't mean that it's actually gonna be okay for the birds. And I'll defer all that to the veterinarians if you have questions about that. All right, so uh, non-chemical controls, one great option is diatomaceous earth. This is an organic approved material and it's fairly easy to um, get either in feed stores or online. One important thing is to make sure it's food grade. There are different types of diatomaceous earth. You do not want the kind that are used in swimming pools because uh, the, the material is different and it can actually cause uh, lung damage to you. And uh, the best way that we have found to use diatomaceous earth is to make the chickens work for it. So chickens and other birds uh, perform dust bathing behaviors. These behaviors help keep their feathers in good condition. So they're gonna do this fairly regularly. And they are gonna be much better at getting these materials into their feathers than we ever will be dusting them ourselves. So I've got a short video showing you a chicken dust bathing. And you can see her kicking up that material, really working it into her feathers. So if this bird has ectoparasites and we introduce uh, an insecticidal material to this dust bath, she is gonna treat her ectoparasites all on her own. And this is something that we have shown in studies. So we've worked a lot with this. And the best way we found to do this is to introduce a specific dust box. So we like to use plastic uh, containers. This is a concrete mixing bin. It's inexpensive and it's really heavy duty plastic. So uh, the chickens are gonna perch on it, they're gonna poop on it. It's real easy to uh, hose out every once in a while and keep clean. And we use sand as the main substrate. So washed play sand works really well. It doesn't have a lot of extra dust in there. Um, and they're gonna be attracted to fine materials. And the sand itself is not gonna do anything for the ectoparasites. Um, however, again, if we introduce an insecticidal material such as this food grade diatomaceous earth, that DE is gonna uh, scratch the cuticle of the insects and ectoparasites, and it causes them to uh, desiccate and die. So that's how this is working. Um, as terms of how much DE, most of this is gonna be sand. We introduce about six cups of DE to the sand. Make sure that you wear a dust mask because it can irritate human lungs. Chickens have a different respiratory system. They're okay with this dust. So they're gonna be in there, their face is gonna be in it, they're fine. Um, but you wanna make sure you, the human, is safe when you first introduce this and uh, let them dust bathe. Um, some tricks, I've heard people, their, their chickens already have a place they like to dust bathe, so it's difficult to get them to use the box. Put the box where they like to dust bathe. There might be something about that spot. And uh, Dr. Blatchford will talk a little bit more about, you know, 
light, uh, sunlight and things that help uh, promote dust bathing. Um, but there might be something about that spot that you don't know what it is, so put the dust box there. I will mention, a lot of people tell me they've used DE and it doesn't work. Um, they threw it in the environment, and I'll tell you, so when I was doing my experiments, I removed the dust boxes, and there's plenty of DE already in the substrate. So this is litter, bedding, straw, it's a little bit dark to see, um, but these are chickens dust bathing. So there's DE there. It did nothing for the ectoparasites. And the reason seems to be is the sand is a really good carrier. It's a fine enough material that helps get that DE into the feathers. So if you just go out and put DE in their, uh, you know, where they're foraging and whatnot, it's probably not going to do anything. Having that dedicated dust box with the sand really seems to work the best. Other options, especially, um, I get lots of questions about scaly leg mite, what to do about that, or um, the stick tight fleas. You can use things like Vaseline or mineral oil. Uh, what Vaseline does is it clogs up their spiracles, which is how insects and arthropods breathe. And so if they're not able to breathe, they will die or they'll drop off. Um, so that is essentially smothering them. Um, and the same sort of idea with the mineral oil. All right, if you need more resources, uh, again, a lot, I think a lot of people defer to the internet. It can be a really good resource, but uh, make sure you're using good websites. So uh, things that end in .gov, .edu, um, these can be much more reputable sources for you to turn to. Uh, it doesn't have to be University of California. It can be other states. It can be North Carolina. It can be University of Florida. They have uh, good resources as well that you can use if you're looking for uh, insect or ectoparasite information. Uh, so University Extension, uh, it can be really good for this. Beware of blogs. There's a lot of people who mean well, um, but that doesn't mean that they've vetted these uh, sources. Again, uh, I'll bring up the frontline uh, example. This is something that has really taken off on blogs, so please just be careful. There's something about insects and insect control that really just gets um, lots of misinformation out there on the, uh, on the internet. And one trick, if you want to make sure that you're um, finding good resources, is to use the scientific names. So I didn't present any of them today. They're long, they're hard to remember. Um, but you can do an initial Google search, find out what that scientific name is, and then plug that back into your Google search. And that can really help you find good university websites and resources. I'll just mention that we do have a veterinary entomology website. This is a nationwide effort, so veterinary entomologists from all over the country contribute to this. We have uh, not just poultry. If you have horses or cattle or other animals, we have resources here on this website. Um, we have information on pest management. We have information about pesticides, and we also have um, a directory of veterinary entomologists if you want to contact someone directly. So this can be a good reference for you. With that, I'll just remind you, uh, you can do this. You don't have to burn everything to the ground and start over from scratch. Um, it can be done. And with that, thank you so much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Yeah. So the question is, are these DE dust boxes safe for other animals? The answer is yes. So they are used in other animal and livestock um, situations. And this food grade, people actually eat this. So this is generally regarded as a safe material. So the question, the follow-up question is, um, how often do the materials need to be replaced? This is really going to depend on your flock and how many animals use it. In our studies, we found that we could leave the sand in there and we just introduced maybe a cup or two of DE every week. Um, we had a fairly high density of birds though, so you might not even need to replace it that often. And then maybe once a month you dump the sand, hose it out. Uh, the birds are going to poop in it, they're going to bring stuff in there. So again, this is really going to be uh, flock dependent, how you, how you upkeep it. Yes? <laughs> Yes, so the question is, what happens when DE gets wet? Um, it will dry, so the actual material that um, 
is affecting the parasites, it's not changing when it gets wet. What might change is the birds might not be as willing to dust bathe in it if it's wet. So if there is a way to keep it under cover, um, that would be preferred. But um, we've had our sand and our DE get wet, and it doesn't necessarily affect its usefulness. It might just affect how the birds are using it. Yes? Okay, good question. So the question was about life cycle of bed bugs first and then soft ticks. So bed bugs are, uh, they're variable. They depend a lot on, uh, temperature and the host. Uh, it's gonna be between, uh, lice and, and fleas probably. So 14 plus days for bed bugs to complete their life cycle. Uh, soft ticks, they're very long lived creatures. So um, they can actually, there have been reports of soft ticks years without a host. And then when they have um, a host uh, present itself coming out of this stupor to feed. Um, so I, I can't give you the exact numbers, but the soft ticks uh, and ticks in general, they're really good at just waiting it out until there's a host. Yeah, <laughs> bad news. Yes. Okay, so the question is uh, how to kind of fill in these cracks on, on nest boxes. Um, so a lot of the nest boxes I've encountered, they're wood, and they might not have uh, good joints. So um, if it's like a big block of nest boxes and you have kind of these dividers, there might be cracks behind the dividers. Uh, I, I tend to think of things like caulk. If you can go in and caulk those uh, cracks and crevices and fill them so that they can't become hiding places for mites or bed bugs or ticks. Um, but that's going to vary a lot based on your own situation. Uh, I don't know what the effects of, of a stain might do um, in that case. Okay, that's a good question. Is uh, there a need to clean the outside run? That's going to depend on your property. Um, some of these ectoparasites, if they are dislodged and they're in the environment, they might not survive very long if they're exposed to uh, the sun directly, hot, dry weather. Um, the fleas, it might depend on if they can get cover, so how deep uh, the litter might be. So that's, unfortunately, I can't answer that with a blanket question. It's really going to depend, um, and it might depend on what kind of ectoparasites you're dealing with. Yes? That's a good question. So it, uh, the question is about if you have lice and mites on the same flock, how you might go about controlling. Uh, and one thing I didn't mention was in our survey, we actually found a lot of instances where birds were parasitized with more than one type of ectoparasites. So it's, it's very common to have multiple louse species, but we also found lice and fleas or fleas, lice, and mites. Um, there's lots of different combinations. Uh, one thing that we have found is uh, with mites, they don't do very well when there are lice on, on the birds. Um, so that might be something where if you're a little patient, the lice might actually drive out the mites. And I know that sounds very weird um, to kind of use lice as a biocontrol agent to get rid of your mites. Uh, but the lice are only feeding on the feathers. They're not blood feeding. So they're less damaging if you want to look at it from that standpoint. Though it depends on your tolerance. If you don't want any of them, um, so what you would probably do so they're all on the host is find something, something like the DE, where it's going to be affecting everything on the host. That would work for both the lice and the mites. So start there. Yeah, so the follow-up question is like, how do it treat the environment? So uh, because the lice and mites are mostly on the host, uh, I would focus on on-host treatments, but if you're worried um, about maybe mites got off and they're hiding out in the environment, uh, you could also use a premise spray or something to treat the environment. That would be a good two-way approach to uh, try and handle that. Yes? Uh, <sighs> I knew there was going to be a question about ivermectin. Um, that's something that you need to consult a vet for. Uh, I know that you can buy ivermectin kind of over the counter, but everything I've seen is for different types of animals. So cattle or uh, dogs or cats. And again, you these formulations, they're generally species specific. So if you're putting something that's meant for cattle on your chickens, that could be really dangerous. I'm not a vet. I can't tell you exactly why that's dangerous or what might happen. Um, I have heard of veterinarians 
using ivermectin for things like scaly leg mite because it is uh, in the skin. So ivermectin is systemic. It gets into the tissues. Um, so I've heard of that, but I would consult a vet and really find out what you can use and what will be safe for the bird and then also for the eggs down the line. Merton, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So there is a website called Farad, F-A-R-A-D dot org that um, has kind of off-label use. It's a resource that vets use, and it can um, be a resource if you want to use something off-label, how to use it safely. Yeah, so just to paraphrase that for the mic, um, with food animals, it can be really dangerous to use things off-label because it can get incorporated into the meat or the eggs. So uh, with ivermectin specifically, uh, you should not be eating the eggs or any of the meat when they're on that um, and consult with a veterinarian because uh, it can be really dangerous. One of the things with your cats and dogs and why things like Frontline work for them is we don't eat our cats or dogs. It doesn't matter the withdrawal period, how long it takes for that uh, material to get out of the tissues. But with things like chickens, it can really uh, be important. So the question is about uh, if you bathe them, what kind of soap to use. Um, I just use a little bit of dish soap. It works really well. Um, don't use cat or dog specific stuff or things that might have an insecticide. You might not know how that's going to rub off or get incorporated in the chicken. Just good old dish soap works really well, just a little bit. Yes. Uh, so the question is about flies, and actually I could give an entire hour conversation just about flies. Um, just real quickly, uh, flies are associated with the manure. And anytime you have birds, you're going to have manure, and that's where they're going to um, be coming from, most likely. So if you can uh, treat the manure, uh, and when I say treat, I just mean make it unsuitable for flies. So either dry it out or remove it so the flies can't use it. That generally is uh, good. So you're managing the manure when you're trying to manage flies. Uh, specifically, the question was about fly strike. So fly strike is when... Um, there are maggots laid, uh, eggs laid that turn into maggots uh, on the animals, and they typically do not feed on living tissues, but sometimes they can cause problems. Um, this is not typically a huge problem in poultry. This is more of an isolated incident. Um, keeping, if you have birds that have underlying issues, so if they have things like enteritis where they're having diarrhea or um, other health issues, that can build up in the vent area, and that's where you might start to see flies. So you really need to treat the underlying cause of those issues, and that should help clear up the flies, because this is not typical um, in, in poultry to have things like fly strike. So, um, and that's something I, I didn't mention either. A lot of these ectoparasites, if you have you know, healthy birds, they can usually fight these infestations. They're either grooming or they have immune responses. Um, so when you come in and inter interfere, you're just helping with that little extra bit. But if you have lots of issues, it could be that your birds are not, you know, there's some other underlying health issue going on um, with, with the birds. I hope that answered your question. And I will be around through lunch if you have additional questions or you think of something, um, please come up and ask me. So thank you very much.